morning, everybody. Welcome to the Washington Institute for Near East Policy. I'm Matt Levitt. I'm the former Wexler Fellow and the director of the Reinhardt Program on Counterterrorism Intelligence. And I'm really pleased uh, to be here this morning uh, with my colleagues Michael Knights uh, and Aaron Zellen to discuss uh, the very timely and topical issue of the Islamic State's resurgence uh, in the COVID era and defeat to renewal in Iraq uh, and in Syria. It's been almost three years since the Islamic State uh, lost Mosul, uh, more than a year since it lost its control of territory. Um, and yet, uh, recent events kind of upend the whole notion of the Islamic State group uh, being completely uh, defeated. Uh, while the group's current status is a far cry from its peak uh, five years ago, and even from its low point uh, a year ago, the fact is that the grievances and the conditions which led to its resurgence uh, back in 2012, 2014, uh, remain. And on top of that, the coronavirus pandemic has opened new opportunities uh, in which the Islamic State group can exploit uh, vacuums that have been created. So in what ways has the Islamic State uh, recovered? Where does it plan to go from here? How will its operations uh, affect local security and the U.S. role in preventing a fuller revival? Uh, to discuss these questions is really no one better than uh, Aaron Zellin uh, and Michael Knights. Aaron Zellin is the Institute's Richard Borrow Fellow in its counterterrorism program, the visiting research scholar uh, at Brandeis University, and the author of the new and must purchase book, Your Sons Are at Your Service, Tunisia's uh, Missionaries of Jihad. He's also the founder of the widely cited website Jihadology, uh, which just celebrated its 10 year anniversary. Mabruk uh, Aaron. Michael Knights is a senior fellow uh, with the Washington Institute in its military studies program. He's traveled uh, each year now uh, for uh, many years, I think since 2003, uh, to Iraq, working on the ground alongside security forces and militias both. He regularly briefs U.S. policymakers, congressional committees, military officers on regional security issues. Uh, his latest um, uh, article on the very issue at hand, entitled Remaining and Expanding, was published uh, just this morning by the Combating Terrorism Center uh, Sentinel uh, magazine online. So with no further ado, uh, Aaron, we'll start with you on the status in Syria. Mike, then we'll go to you on uh, the status in Iraq. And then we'll take questions and answers. Uh, if you are on uh, the Blue Jeans login, you can uh, populate the chat box with your questions directly. If you are watching this via a live stream service, either on the Washington Institute's, Institute's website or Facebook, you can send in a question at the email address policyforum at washingtoninstitute.org. Aaron, over to you. All right, great. Uh, thank you. So a lot has happened for uh, the Islamic State over the last year. Of course, as we know, at the end of March 2019, the group um, lost its last claim over territory in Bahu's Syria. Um, and since then, they've had to contend with not only um, continuing their ability to operate as an insurgency, um, but also so that uh, they've had to deal with a leadership transition since we know that Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi um, was killed uh, in October last year. Um, so in this presentation, I'm sort of going to look at what ISIS has been up to in Syria pretty much since uh, the fall of their territorial control and where they are today and what this means in terms of uh, going forward. So first off, I think it's important to note that although IS did lose territory um, uh, last year, they never were truly defeated. They still remained in cellular form and conducting um, terrorist attacks every once in a while. Um, in the intervening months in the spring and summer of 2019, you saw them transition to sort of what they had been doing um, in the prior decade in Iraq specifically, where they're essentially following the same format that they did to try and come back that they did then where they're focusing on revenge attacks against those who collaborated with the United States and the coalition and the SDF, but also um, they're focusing on sort of quality attacks against sort of top uh, security people, 
um, not necessarily going after rank and file people completely because they know that if you go after these top security people, then they're harder to replace. Um, in addition to that, they're also calling for people to repent to them so that they can try and replenish their ranks um, for those that might feel that they're endangered. So as you can see, these are the number of attacks in each governorate where they've uh, operated over the last now about uh, 14 months. And Derizor province has been the largest by far. Um, I would argue that that's primarily their base of operations now. Um, and there are a number of reasons for that, which I'll get into. Um, but as you can see, even though Raqqa was considered sort of one of its dual capitals in the Iraq, Syria, um, Wilayat it controlled, it's actually not that powerful in terms of its operations there. Um, one of the things to look out for that I've noticed and I'll get into is sort of the Dara governorate um, in southern Syria, which although it doesn't have too many attacks, we've seen a large uptick in the last couple of months. Um, and they did have networks there previously. Um, so uh, the fact that there's a reemergence of a low level insurgency there, not just from ISIS, but the broader opposition who are not happy with the way that the Assad regime took over the area and it's so-called, um, you know, uh, trying to bring people back into the regime's good graces, which means either arresting or killing people, um, has created an atmosphere um, where IS can take advantage of um, in the coming months. So just to sort of picture where this is all going on, um, the Deir Ezzor province is in the, uh, sort of eastern part of Syria, and it's in the Euphrates River Valley. And as you can see from the map, that's where the majority of the attacks have happened since the beginning of this year in particular. Um, and then you also see the cluster in southern Syria in the Dar region, as well as some stuff here and there in the desert region there, um, uh, uh, Palmyra, as well as some stuff in uh, Raqqa as well. But, uh, it's, it's key to understand what's going on in Deir Ezzor and why they're so strong there um, in particular. So one of the things to note is that the force that the U.S. has been working with, the Syrian Democratic Forces, is primarily Kurdish, and their main heartland is more in the Hasaka province, which is north of Deir Ezzor, whereas uh, Deir Ezzor province is mainly Arabs and more tribal. Uh, therefore, in many ways, the SDF is so-called away team in the Deir Ezzor province and, and don't have the same kind of control or necessarily uh, local support or even, um, uh, you know, connections to the local population. And therefore, this has allowed the Islamic State in the first place to sort of uh, continue its operations in the aftermath of the fall of its territory. Um, but... What exacerbated this was last October when Turkey went into parts of northern Syria and therefore provided space um, for ISIS to operate again because the SDF was most worried about its own populations in Hasaka province and the potential for Turkey to, um, you know, conduct attacks through its proxies in northern Syria against the SDF um, and, and also, you know, ethnically cleansing different parts of the region as well. And therefore, for them, it was more about protecting their own community than anything. Then you also had the issue of the so-called U.S. withdrawal. Of course, we know that the U.S. continues to have forces in eastern Syria, but it's in a smaller box than it had been previously. And therefore, um, its areas of operations and sort of control is not what it had been prior to October, since it's more boxed into the oil um, uh, installations as well as the areas in Hasaka province where the SDF control and not as much in uh, the Deir Ezzor region anymore. And therefore, this provided the opportunity for IS to conduct its revenge attacks. It's also in sort of an ironic way done attacks against um, the supply lines related to gas and oil um, because the U.S. talked about how its main objective now was to protect the oil um, in eastern Syria in the aftermath of the so-called withdrawal. Um, and they've uh, hit a number of convoys that have been going from there into the Assad regime territory where um, uh, some of this has been um, uh, sold. Then you also have the issue of kidnappings where you see the classic kidnap for ransom, but also this has provided opportunities for IS to do some prisoner swaps. Um, 
but also it's a way for them to gather intelligence on their enemies. Um, so that's uh, one, these are the sort of the main reasons why we've seen this uptick in um, Derazor in particular, and why it's sort of the base of the group now, in contrast to sort of what we thought of when we thought of the sort of 2013 to 2017-18 IS, which was more Raqqa centered. And just to note some of the things we've seen since the Turkish invasion, on the top right for those who are watching online is a statement put out by the Islamic State. Um, and they're distributing this pamphlet to um, uh, residents in the Deir or countryside beginning in October 2019, sort of warning civilians against working with the autonomous administration, which is the civilian government um, of the SDF, um, and, and that they would essentially start executing people if they knew that people were collaborating with them in their sort of civilian efforts. Um, from there, we've seen um, another example of this um, where in early April this year, so only about you know six or seven weeks ago, they're distributing another flyer, um, this time in the town of Al Husseiniya, and this one's specifically on the map, um, again, warning people about working with the SDF and the Autonomous Administration. Um, and then you also have a number of other things on this map highlighting certain things that have happened since um, their ability to operate more so since October. So in November 2019, we saw in the town of Al Busera um, that IS took con has taken control of that town a couple of times during the nighttime, um, illustrating that the SDF does not necessarily have full control of some of these villages. Similarly, in mid-December 2019, they were able to briefly take over the town of Ashola. Um, then in a place like Al Hawaij, they're able to impose taxes, more extortion on the local population there on a number of occasions. Um, likewise, in relation to kidnappings, there was a case of six individuals being kidnapped in the village of El Tibni. Um, and then more recently, uh, in mid-April 2020, so about a month ago, in Gharbiya Sharkia, um, they're able to set up sort of flying or temporary checkpoints where they're able to then raid shops in uh, the village as well as extort people for money as well. And then most recently, only about a week or two ago, um, in the town of El Suar, um, they threatened a number of shopkeepers there as well and asking for them to pay money to them as well. So we could see that uh, their activities are not just specifically, um, you know, your uh, traditional insurgent activities, but also ways to harass local populations, but also to try and fund them, as well as to show that they're still there and therefore people need to fear them and that they still are trying to attempt maybe some really basic shadow governance on some levels. Another area that I uh, just mentioned that I think is important to think about is the resumed insurgency that we're seeing in southern Syria. Um, obviously, it's nowhere near what it was at its height, um, you know, four, five, six years ago, when many rebel factions, not just the jihadists, were sort of at the gates of Damascus in many regards. Um, but the fact that we've seen uh, renewed violence by opposition figures um, does provide space for then IS to operate and potentially recruit new individuals who do have grievances against the regime in the way that the regime, as well as Iranian Shia militias and Russians have dealt with them retaking the territory, which has pr primarily been executing people, jailing people, disappearing people, uh, among other things. Um, and therefore, in just since the beginning of the year, we've seen a number of attacks in both southern Kunetra as well as um, in different parts of uh, North uh, East uh, 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 Dara region, as well as uh, Northwest Sueda. And what's noteworthy about where these attacks have occurred specifically on the map is that these were, there had previously been active ISIS cells when they were operating there, um, you know, a few years ago. So even though um, they were seemingly seen to be uh, taken out um, in these locations, they're able to continue to um, maintain their ability uh, to operate there even under harsh conditions over the last couple of years. And now that, that there's space, they're starting to pop back up and it's something to look forward to. I should note that, you know, compared to Deir Zor, 
it's nothing like that in terms of their operational capacity or sort of the speed of the attacks or the quality of the attacks. But uh, it is worrisome just because of the potential of the grievances there um, due to the way the Assad regime has been uh, treating people there. And then just to uh, conclude this uh, sort of survey of what we've seen in Syria over the last about a year is still the issue of Islamic State prisoners and women and children that are in the IDB camps in northeast Syria under SDF control. It's an abdication of leadership and responsibility, especially uh, the foreigners um, within this and the foreign countries that have yet to take back their citizens. I wrote a report on this um, last October, and honestly, not much has changed since then in terms of returning people home to try and try them and bring justice. But also the fact that this creates issues that we saw a decade ago in Iraq that uh, Mike might uh, describe um, if it's relevant in his talk, is you know the issue of them potentially breaking people out of prisons. We saw this in 2012 and 13 and 14. And one of the things that people might not remember is that while we ended up seeing some successful uh, breakouts in places like Taji and Abu Ghraib um, in the latter part of when we started to see that ISIS was really back um, at that time, but there were a number of attempts beforehand that failed so the fact that we have seen a number of attempts of riots in these prisons or failures of being able to break them out by the Islamic State specifically does not necessarily mean that it won't necessarily happen um, in the coming months or year. Um, and one of the things to remember is that when they're able to break these people out of prison, uh, you know, seven or eight years ago, uh, it provided them uh, people that had been a part of the group previously back into their ranks, and therefore that sort of hypercharged their ability to fight again. And the thing to note in this context is that not only would it help on that front for those within the prisons, but if you're looking towards those in the IDB camps, uh, this could also help in terms of bringing back, you know, the, the governance apparatus of the Islamic State as well, because the women were involved in it too. And just the fact of the way that, um, the Islamic State frames the children in this is that they're part of this broader societal and multi-generational project um, to seed sort of this next generation and build this up so that it's a sustainable project over time and that it doesn't just go away after five years or so. So the fact that there still hasn't really been a solution to those who have been imprisoned or those in these IDP camps, whether those that are Syrians and Iraqis or those that are foreigners. And yes, there have been some people that have been returned to society in both uh, parts of Syria and Iraq, as well as some foreigners, but it's still very small. At its height, uh, the Al Hol camp, for example, which is the largest one, had around 72,000 individuals. Now it's down to 65,000. It's great that 7,000 people have, uh, you know, left the camp for a variety of reasons, but 65,000 is still a huge number, and it's just a similar simmering problem that's going to create issues um, over time, just because many, especially the children. Um, who it wasn't their choice to join up or be a part of this um, process with the Islamic State, have only lived under IS territorial control or in these uh, conditions within the IDP camps. And you can only imagine what that will bring um, in the future. So I'll leave it at there and I look forward to any uh, questions uh, or comments that people might have. Thank you. Great, Aaron. Thank you very much, Mike. Over to you. Um, so I'm introducing today something that just launched on Twitter um, a few uh, minutes uh, before we came on, uh, which is a new study in uh, the West Point Combat and Terrorism Center journal Sentinel. Uh, big uh, like 8,000 plus word uh, footnoted study, uh, which looks at 18 months of Islamic State attack data uh, inside Iraq. Uh, six quarters, uh, broken down by quarter, by month, by uh, type of attack, uh, locations, etc. Um, here's a uh, you know a look at what it it looks like. It's up there on the um, on my Twitter uh, and at the West Point Combating Terrorism Center uh, Twitter uh, account as well. You can download it in PDF. Uh, what we did here was uh, myself and my co-author uh, Alex Almeida. Uh, went through over 3,600 uh, attack items, uh, attack sort of geolocated attack uh, reports inside Iraq, uh, looked at them in detail, uh, added in uh, many thousands of non-attack uh, data points, 
we did a very careful scraping of the attack data set uh, to ensure that we were not including non-ISIS attacks like militia attacks, criminal attacks. Uh, so very discriminating and conservative look at uh, Islamic State attack metrics, being very careful to remove any duplicates or potential duplicates. Uh, and uh, you know, looking across uh, the main Islamic State provinces in Iraq, rural Baghdad belts, Nineveh, Kirkuk, Salahuddin, Diyala, Ambar. Um, so, what did we uh, what did we find out from uh, from this? Um, you know, the first thing we should say is what what we're not seeing. Um, you know, we're not talking about a recovery of Islamic State to uh, 2014 levels when they controlled big swathes of Iraq in the second half of the year and when they were a, a boiling hot insurgency in the first half of the year. We're not talking about 2013 levels either. Um, we're talking about them uh, coming down to something just under 2012 levels uh, when they were um, on the upswing and in an early stage of their uh, recovery uh, in Iraq where they were trying to build momentum. Uh, that's kind of the point we're at. Uh, you know, in uh, in something like uh, 2013, uh, the Islamic State undertook uh, by our, our metrics, uh, so captured and, and counted in the same way, 6,216 attacks in Iraq. So you can see that the present uh, for 2019, 1,669 is still well short of that. Um, this is something that I'm going to talk about throughout this um, short presentation. But they're at 2012 levels. They have a slightly different model than they did in 2012 in Iraq, a different way forward. But they're also quite distant from 2013. Um, in 2013, it, was, it took one year for them to get from their 2012 levels to their 2013 levels because a number of factors were playing in their advantage. And strategically, they were on the upswing. Syria was uh, you know, an environment that they, they could operate in very, uh, very confidently and they could tap into all the military resources of a civil war in progress. Uh, in Iraq, the security forces were being decapitated by the uh, corrupt networks and uh, militias who were removing the good officers from control after the U.S. withdrew. And then there was the issue of the of the coalition's withdrawal from Iraq in uh, in in complete its complete withdrawal in 2011. We don't have that condition right now. I'm going to return to those kind of drivers. Um, also, in 2012, people within the Sunni provinces of Iraq didn't know what it would be like if the Iraqi government was defeated and excluded from the area. At that point, they were still looking at a range of different insurgent movements, some more nationalistic, some more Ba'athist, some more Islamic State oriented. And they didn't know what the future would bring uh, if they ever defeated the Iraqi state militarily. Now they do know. Uh, first of all, those types of movements were decimated by ISIS. Not, you know, all the many of the nationalist and Baathist elements were uh, were eviscerated. Secondly, uh, ISIS, uh, you know, ruled in a very bloody and heavy-handed manner. Uh, thirdly, ISIS could not defend its uh, territorial holdings. And fourthly, uh, you know, the process of getting liberated from ISIS was extremely painful. Your cities get flattened by air power. Uh, your rural areas get um, get uh, garrisoned by uh, Shia militias from the south. So. You know, I don't think the same conditions exist to allow uh, the Islamic State to go from a 2012 level to a 2013 level in one year. More likely, it would take them three years of the government in Iraq making all the wrong moves. And then for them to get to a 2014 level where they were beginning to really defeat the Iraqi military in a sustainable way on the ground, uh, that might take another few years more of mistakes. What that suggests is uh, that things may not be heading in the right direction, but that we have time to nip this in the bud. As long as we keep those conditions in place, that Syria doesn't get much worse, that the Iraqi security forces are well led, that the coalition remains engaged in Iraq. Um, so let's um, move on and we'll take a look at some of the attack metrics. So, uh, you know, the basic trend we're looking at here, the top uh, light blue line is all, all attacks. And the, the bottom ones are sort of subcategories, which I'll get onto in a minute. Uh, but basically, you know, the uh, let's say Q1 2018, Islamic State threw 445 attacks in Iraq. 
2019, that had dropped to 292. They did a, a dip in Iraq uh, in, in sort of uh, late 2018 through uh, early 2019. And in Q1 2020, uh, they were back up to 550, 566 attacks uh, in Iraq. So what we've really seen is a sort of steady recovery of Islamic State operations, both qualitatively and quantitatively in Iraq, since about the second quarter of 2019. It's been quite a steady rise. And it's had some very interesting uh, individual uh, facets. A lot of people looking at Islamic State right now are saying oh, it's COVID, it's the withdrawal of US forces uh, because of militia threats and withdrawal of coalition advisors because of COVID. Um, you know, it's it's these kind of things. But, of course, but what we can see from the data is that um, the Islamic State recovery in Iraq is largely a result of Islamic State planning and execution. Uh, it's something that they laid the framework for and the seeds for in previous years. They demonstrated significant foresight. Uh, they um, did a couple of things. First, they laid down a physical infrastructure for insurgency. Uh, hundreds, if not thousands, of caches, caves, mainly in cave systems, which are each, each an insurgency in a box. Weapons, ammunition, bulk explosives, bomb components, trail bikes, generators, photovoltaic uh, uh, generators, uh, you know, for, for taking solar power, communications devices, vehicles even. Um, I'm betting there's a tank or two down there uh, somewhere, which will turn up one day. Uh, these guys were real tunnelers. And then what they did was they bought back from Syria some of their key Iraqi cadres um, in progressively in stages. And we can see how the reinsertion of these individuals, Iraqis mainly, uh, is... Uh, affecting both tactical leadership at a local level and bomb making, particularly the use of roadside bombs. Um, you can see on the um, on the slide here, uh, we have a, uh, a subcategory of all attacks, which is called high quality attacks. That's the dark blue line. And then below that, I've broken out those high quality attacks into their four main types, which are roadside bombs, with which we've seen significant uptick, including many of the old tactics from the, even the pre-2011 days, a more advanced sort of pairing of bombing and non-bombing tactics together. You burn some fields, you set IEDs to kill the security forces that come to investigate, you fire mortars, you cover the mortar base plate location where the patrols will come uh, with, uh, with bombs, um, victim-operated bombs. You leave a bomb in the open, and when the uh, uh, when the bombing, uh, uh, you know, uh, explosive ordnance uh, demolition uh, engineers come in, you shoot them with the sniper. You know, there's a lot more tactical thinking, and that's also shown itself in what we call overrun attacks, which mean attacks that uh, either overrun an Iraqi security force checkpoint, observation point, one of these small outposts. Uh, or let's say kill around half the people in that checkpoint. So a very effective and, and you know dangerous attack against the checkpoint. So you know I think it's a long it's a long lead uh, problem that we've been looking at here. Um, they have quite carefully uh, developed the ground for stronger insurgency in Iraq. Also, uh, just as a methodological point, you know coalition forces in Iraq um, tend to view. Islamic State as still throwing mainly low quality attacks, but I think that might be a slightly wrong way of looking at it. What's a low quality attack to us as the coalition is not a low quality attack to Iraqi forces on the ground. You know, it might not be a threatening attack as far as we can see it because we have mine resistant ambush protected vehicles, route clearance, intelligence, life saving uh, um, equipment and, and training, uh, personal protective equipment. But to Iraqis riding around in a flatbed of a Hilux, not wearing any uh, any body armor and not having any uh, medical capabilities, even the smallest roadside bombing attacks can be highly lethal. Uh, likewise, uh, the coalition tends to focus on mass casualty attacks in cities as the key indicator or external attack plotting against foreign countries as indicators of, uh, of capability. But in a rural insurgency like in Iraq, these are not the things we probably need to be counting. We more need to be counting the roadside bombings, the overruns uh, and so on. Across the provinces uh, of Iraq, uh, we also have uh, some interesting uh, variation. Um, Iraq is a bigger environment than Syria. 
uh, it has more population, it has more economy, it's a bigger prize uh, for Islamic State. And there's probably a larger number of Islamic State fighters who are Iraqis than Syrians. I, I don't know if that's true, but Aaron will, will, will shake his head if it's wrong. Um, but, um, but we can say this, you know, where, where Deir Azur, what you're looking at with Deir Azur, there currently in Iraq is uh, one Deir Azur on a regular basis, Diyala province, uh, the most uh, uh, consistent pro producer and generator of ISIS attacks uh, since 2003. It has complex human and physical terrain, including jungle delta type conditions along the Diyala River Valley and a uh, significant amount of, you know, foothills, remote foothills, very difficult to navigate with armored vehicles and so on uh it's also a place though where the militias are present the iran backed militias and where coalition forces cannot embed and accompany the local uh forces cannot sit in the local operations command cannot help them to uh build a um you know the best counterinsurgency they can build tapping into all the coalition's intelligence and air power as well as special forces capabilities. In the two places where that combination was happening, where Iraqi forces, uh, non-military Iraqi forces were leading, joined at the hip with coalition forces and air power, Ninua and Kirkuk, we saw a, a reduction in the sort of levels of uh, violence, or at least we saw uh, you know, a slower growth. We basically saw a constraining of the insurgency in those places, particularly Kirkuk, which in 2018 was the, the engine room of the insurgency in Iraq, and in 2019 that sort of, that sort of dropped off uh, considerably. Places where the coalition can't get, where the Iraqi security forces are not in charge of the counterinsurgency, such as Diyala, such as Southern Saladin, uh, such as um, some parts of the uh, of the Baghdad belts, uh, you know, those places are starting to become uh, more prolific generators of attacks again. And we've seen some of the most sophisticated ISIS attacks in recent months take part in those places. Southern Diyala, uh, you know, around the area around uh, like Balad uh, in um, in southern Saladin, Tamiya uh, in northern Baghdad belts. Um, so there is a correlation, I think, between areas that the coalition can't get at, uh, typically because of uh, Iranian-backed militia interference, and where Islamic State knows it can set up uh, its safest bastions to operate out of. And that's something that the new Iraqi government uh, will need to look at uh, dealing with. Just to finish off, um, I'll say that... Uh, you know, at the moment, we're at this 2012 uh, level, um, but as I say, it's going to take them a couple of years of Iraqi government doing the wrong thing to get to 2013 uh, level again. Um, let's all watch the indicators of Syria, of Iraqi security force leadership, of combined joint task force presence and act ability to operate in Iraq. And also, you know, this uh, next generation that's incubating, uh, as, um, as Aaron's uh, talked about it. For me, the Islamic State, at the moment has what I would call a rural overmatch strategy, which means that, you know, they're trying to create bastions and no-go zones in rural areas in which uh, the Iraqi government uh, and, and Syrian security forces too simply give up on. They're too difficult. And for many years, if you read the U.S. Uh, Army's uh, official history of the Iraq war, you know, it, it, it says in quite clear terms, there were certain areas where US military for many years um, did not bother going, ultimately, did not bother trying to establish a significant permanent presence because those areas were not heavily populated. They were not economically vital to the country. And, Isla and Islamic State and its forerunners, ISI and AQI, had made those areas simply too painful to go to. They were not worth the cost of being there. And that's what the Islamic State counts upon. It's going to the least populated areas in Iraq. It's depopulating them if there is a still a thin population there. And it is um, it's counting on the fact that the Iraqi security forces and the coalition could be deterred from going into those areas, particularly if Shia militias interfere uh, with the coalition support to Iraq. Um, you know, this is the challenge uh, going forward. Uh, as Aaron you know, knows better than me, uh, the Islamic State can always wait for better conditions uh, for a future day when Syria is worse, when the Iraqi security forces are worse, when the coalition's gone. And they know exactly where to hide out uh, to, um, to last as long as they can. So I'll leave it there for the moment. I look forward to the Q&A session.
Thank you both very much. Uh, excellent presentations. Uh, I want to remind everybody that uh, if you're on the Blue Jeans chat, you can send in your questions directly in the chat function. Uh, and if you're not, if you're watching via live stream, you are uh, encouraged, welcome and encouraged to send in questions to the email address policyforum at washingtoninstitute.org. Uh, I'll give everybody a moment to think of their questions and take the moderator's prerogative of asking uh, the first couple of questions to our speakers. Um, the first question I'd like to ask to each of you um, is to what extent do you think uh, reconstruction or lack of reconstruction uh, is a uh, potentially powerful grievance uh, in order to defeat uh, the Islamic State uh, coalition ended up having to destroy a lot of areas. Um, reconstruction in some of these areas has been uh, exceedingly slow. Um, how big of a problem is that? And in what way, different of course across the border between Iraq and Syria, what, what can we do more to make this less of a grievance moving forward? Would you like to start? All right. Well, Matt, you you know you indicate which one of us you want to go first, but I'll I'll just take a crack this first time. Um, so uh, I'm in two minds about reconstruction. Uh, you know, in some places, very clearly, whether it be a Ramadi or a Mosul city, uh, you know, there's hardly any reconstruction happening, but there's also hardly any Islamic State militancy happening. I mean, nothing almost so you know the urban environments which were the ones that got really really badly damaged in many cases um i i don't see a direct correlation between in the short term between stabilization rebuilding etc and islamic state bounce back um maybe in the longer term there is maybe it's a more corrosive kind of difficult to spot phenomena that comes from building new generations of people who live in complete dumps, you know, that were totally flattened and uh, that makes them more susceptible over a long time. In the rural areas, I'd say where reconstruction is very important is in resettlement of displaced people. Um, you know, some people focus on the return of displaced people just because to ease humanitarian suffering, etc. Um, understand that. But from a counterinsurgency perspective, something that's occurred to me from an early stage is that Islamic State really likes empty places. It really likes places where there are very few outsiders, informers, pesky population, security forces to protect them. It, you know, and the Islamic, the, the government right now, there's, there's a lot of depopulated villages in Iraq and Islamic State loves those places and the government sticks a remote camera masts in those areas to monitor them but islamic state just takes out the cameras um so and and it, it kills shepherds who move into its areas it prevent actively prevents repopulation and destroys infrastructure so clearly they want these places empty and we want these places not empty with local security forces and police services raised there local village guard networks and stuff so from my perspective you know it's very important to um repopulate a number of strategic villages um urban rebuild I'm, I'm not so sure it has an immediate effect aaron any thoughts um it's a tough question to answer i think it might have a greater effect in southern syria in relation to the assad regime um, than it necessarily does in other places just because you know, we have to remember the reason why this all started in the first place was because of the Assad regime. Um, and, you know, in a dynamic that could potentially play out like Mike described where, yes, in 2011 and on, there were still some insurgent factions in Nineveh and Kirkuk and Salahuddin, et cetera. By the time 2014 went around, IS more or less either killed all the key people or co-opted them, and therefore there's the potential for that in southern Syria going forward, just because there isn't the type of support for those local insurgents that were in the opposition, as you see in northwest Syria with Hayat Tahrir Sham, which essentially is being backed by uh, Turkey and Qatar, 
to make sure the area remains somewhat r running on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and therefore, uh, you know, the lack of reconstruction, but also uh, the Assad regime's way of trying to bring people back into the fold um, definitely creates um, uh, these grievances. Um, it's harder to say in places like Raqqa or Deir ez -Zor, uh, you know, the SDF has been involved in reconstruction projects uh, there. It's obviously not perfect, but again, I, I still think that for uh, many locally, especially in Deir ez -Zor, the fact that you have the IRGC, uh, Iraqi Shia militias, uh, the Assad regime and Russians looking at them on the other side of the river in Deir ez -Zor, provides greater potential for, you know, a tinderbox scenario uh, than reconstruction per se. I think that's just a, a larger issue just because of the way the conflict dynamics have played out. Great. So um, we've got our first two questions coming in. Um, from Roy, uh, for Aaron, Mike, if you have thoughts too. The Syrian regime holds a number of important places in Deir Zor including Abu Kamal, and there are Russian mercenaries in the area as well. What is the interaction between the regime and ISIS and between the Russian proxies and maybe Russian forces? Is ISIS going after them? Are they going after ISIS? Michael, he has one for you too. Aaron, you first. Uh, in terms of IS and the forces on the other side of the river that I just alluded to, uh, most of them are Iraqi Shia militiamen, uh, IRGC, as well as uh, NDF forces of the Assad regime. And there have been clashes and fights uh, here and there on both sides between them. Um, I, I think that uh, for the regime and its allies, maintaining uh, sort of a semblance of normalcy um, in those areas is important to them for their own narrative and propaganda purposes for the regime. So in terms of uh, the areas just on the other side of the river in Deir ez -Zor, you know, they've done what they've needed to do to try and keep things relatively calm. Um, that being said, uh, the regime has a much harder time in dealing with elements that are holed up in places like Jabal Bishri, which is one of the mountains in the uh, desert of uh, Homs. Um, and similar to what Mike was talking about, uh, you know, these, you know, places that are not really populated and providing sort of a safe haven for them to do hit and run type of attacks and then ambush attacks um, and going after uh, Assad regime forces closer to Sukhna and uh, Tadmor. Um, that's been a, a bit of a tougher nut to crack for the regime. And part of that is that the regime mainly is dealing with that because the Iranians and their allies are more interested in the area close to the Iraqi border because that's more related to their own interests um uh, of the you know whole you know connection between iran to iraq to syria to lebanon with the shia militias and proxy networks whereas the stuff in the desert region of uh, homs isn't really that important to the iranians because it has less strategic relevance to them and therefore because of that and the fact that the regime itself isn't that strong without the support of anyone else um they're having a difficult time trying to sort of deal with uh, that type of uh, fighting um, that we see in more of the desert region. And Michael, Roy asks you, your, your data suggests a major insurgency in the making. To what extent is the Iraqi government aware of this phenomenon? And what are they doing to head it off? Yeah, I mean, the Iraqi government, you know, has gone through this cycle uh, a bunch of times. And the current Iraqi government, I'd say, is more realistic than the most. Um, you know, it's led by uh, Mustafa Academy, who until very recently and even now, I think in, in an ongoing capacity, is running the Iraqi National Intelligence Service. The head of the Ministry of Interior is uh, Iraq's most senior uniformed military officer, General Othman Ghanemi. Uh, you know, so we, we have a good security team and I think they're going to listen to uh, their international, um, you know, supporters on this uh, on this this front. And you can see, I mean, they put um, General Abdel Wahab al Saadi back uh, in charge of the counterterrorism service. In fact, moved him up from operational commander to overall commander. These are signs of seriousness. Uh, we're already seeing the Iraqi security forces 
um, well, the special forces uh, begin a more aggressive raiding operation. You can see perhaps the beginning of partnered uh, counterterrorism operations again in Kukuk area in the last week. Uh, so I think they know they have to do something different. They're in the middle of COVID. They're in the middle of an economic crisis, and they're not kind of capitalized um, in terms of even equipment and training to do an actual counterinsurgency. You know, we we trained them to take down the cities. We provide them with the air power to do that, but we haven't really reset to do counterinsurgency. Islamic State can switch from ground holders to insurgents in a couple of months, and they have years ago. Uh, Iraqi security forces take years to switch from ground takers to counterinsurgents. And it's that time lag that we're living in right now where you can appreciate the problem, but the solution is going to require a lot of hard work and a lot of international support and being very, very realistic and not letting political forces, meaning Iran-backed militias, uh, put their own interests above the interests of defeating Daesh. So um, that kind of connects to our next question, which is a general COVID question. Uh, in Syria and Iraq each, would you consider COVID-19 to be a bane or a boon to the Islamic State? And, and how is the group responding to the virus differently uh, in Syria and Iraq? That's, that has as much to do with the impact of the virus on the forces arrayed against the Islamic State. Uh, on either side of the border. Aaron, would you like to start? Yeah, I mean, similar to Mike and what he alluded to earlier, uh, and the fact that IS has had these plans going back some time, I'm unsure how much what we're seeing is really related to coronavirus um, and the outbreak there, especially since, you know, obviously it's hard to get accurate numbers out of Syria or even Eastern Syria about the pandemic there, but it doesn't seem like it's that large in comparison to say China or Iran or parts of the West. Um, and therefore, it's true that the SDF um, has locked down parts of the territories that it's controlled um, with curfews and, and therefore the SDF has had to use resources towards that, but I'm unsure it's really uh, made it more difficult for them to operate against ISIS. I think what we're seeing is more just a continuation of the trajectory of things that had already been going on. Um, and in, in my sense, it's, it seems like at least in the last month or two, it's gone worse in Iraq uh, in a greater way than we've seen in Syria, whereas in Syria, it's just continued at the same pace as it had in the uh, half a year or so prior to that. Mike, and from Dad? Yeah, from my perspective, I mean, there is uh, something inexplicable about the limited impact of COVID in Iraq so far. Um, I don't think it's just under reporting or under testing or social stigma associated with it. I think, you know, there are many indicators you can look at and it, you can see the absence of indicators, such as the absence of senior leadership figures dropping dead, even though, you know, they're not very well screened and they are very, and they're often very old. Um, you know, there's something about Iraq that's given it a certain resistant fabric so far to COVID. Um, COVID should affect uh, organized activity uh, by security forces that have quite tight coupling with society. It should affect them more than an insurgent movement. Um, I think the key effect of COVID though, and it could be a long-term effect, is if it does loosen the commitment of the international community to professionalize Iraq's armed forces. You know, the militias were a part of the reason why coalition trainers left Iraq. Uh, fatigue was a, a reason, but COVID was the excuse. And if those training relationships don't get rebuilt again after COVID, and there is really no after COVID, but you know, in COVID, then, um, then Iraq will be for the worse and the counterinsurgency effort will be weakened as a result. Uh, so I, I think the biggest boost they've got is not a prompt boost that you would feel this month, next month, uh, but but more just, just it, it might have pulled the rug out from underneath the international training mission in Iraq. Excellent. 
We have a few uh, questions and about uh, eight minutes left. So uh, we'll keep our answers nice and focused. Um, this next one is kind of a broad question. From Blake, what are the prospects for setting up a special war crimes tribunal for ISIS foreign fighters and other foreign supporters now housed in the IDP camps? How much value do you see in bringing ISIS's atrocities to light on this type of a stage? Well, that's mostly for Aaron. I'll add to it for Mike, you know, the, the corollary is many countries have called um, for something less of than this if a international tribunal is not possible, and that would be for pushing for the Iraqi government to just try them all in Iraq. Aaron, would you like to start? It's a complicated issue. Um, I'm not a lawyer, so I can't get into any of the legal things related to it, but from what I've heard and read from people that know those things, it's actually quite complicated just because of the evidentiary issues in relation to it. And therefore, it could create uh, problems where people could go to trial. Um, and therefore, uh, there's not enough evidence, and that creates other issues, obviously. Um, we have seen in, our, in Syria, in particular, in Northeast, that the autonomous administration has, you know, in the months before coronavirus, was talking about starting to try people in uh, Northeast Syria for the crimes uh, that they committed in, in those territories as well. It's been postponed because of coronavirus and sort of the quarantine and lockdown there. So that's something to look out for probably in the second half of the year maybe, but uh, that also creates other potential issues such as double jeopardy, just because um, uh, you know if these people end up being returned after they might do some prison sentence uh, in Northeast Syria and then they return home and uh, the local government might wanna go after them, that creates other issues as well. So for me, I think the smartest solution is to bring people's own citizens homes, try them in their countries, and bring them to justice there. Mike, anything to add? No, nothing for me. Great. I'd only add to that myself that, you know, an international tribunal requires international backing, and to date Russia's been uh, pretty dead set uh, against it. Uh, Francisca asks to both of you, how do you predict um, Islamic State operations in the Sahel region and in Libya will impact Islamic State operations in Iraq and Syria? Mike, do you want to set a first go? Any connectivity between them? No, I, I, I mean, I see Iraq being a very Iraqi theater for operations. It's difficult actually to operate foreign fighters in Iraq now, and they have to be, they're always stuck out, but once upon a time, you had enough sort of territorial sway that you you know you you could still move them around and have them interact with local communities. It seems to me to be very split up uh, now, and you know I don't really see many inter international interactions with the Iraqi theatre. Uh, but Aaron, I know you've got a broader focus. You'll have a better answer. Yeah, I mean, um, it's not like it was. I don't think three or four years ago. I think the main connections are more related to the central media, Diwan, and how they propagate uh, their claims of responsibility as well as pictures and attacks um, from those different locations to the broader world uh, on Telegram. Um, you know, I imagine that there are some financial linkages as well, though much of that is clandestine, so it's hard to know the specifics of it. Um, uh, but it, you know, it, it seems that, uh, you know, at least understanding the organizations that generally speaking, there are strategic directives from the central leadership and the delegate committee to the provinces. And then the provinces based off of their own understanding of the local dynamics, decide on the tactics and operations to pursue to, you know, deal with them. Um, I think that there are probably greater linkages between different elements within these networks within parts of Africa itself, whether um, uh, networks that had previously been in Libya when they're controlling territory there, going down to the Sahel region like Nigeria or Mali, um, as well as those that might be linked in the Horn of Africa from Somalia, Tanzania, to these upstart sort of provinces uh, or province in uh, what they call Central Africa and the DRC um, and Mozambique, um, but again, I mainly focus on the Arab world, so I don't want to get into all of that stuff right now. You uh, offered a great segue to our next question. Um, can you share with us your opinion on the financial health of the Islamic State in Iraq 
and in Syria? Is it likely to improve or deteriorate over the next year? And are they financially capable of sustaining operations in the long term? Do you want to start? Sure. In Syria? Oh, you go. Uh, sure. I mean, you know, there's a difference between running a state and bureaucracy and territory than it is running an insurgency. You obviously don't need as many assets or as much money. So even though they don't have as much in their coffers as they had previously, um, you know, uh, they're still able to run. Uh, one of the things to note is that, you know, uh, they had been saving up money prior to the fall of territory. So they've had, you know, money that they can use. But in addition to that, you know, they've continued to be involved in criminal activity, kidnap for ransom. Um, and in some cases, they have these, you know, uh, legitimate front businesses where individuals are part of the group, but they act as civilians and just run them through that and then funnel the money through there. So I don't think that they have any money issues in terms of trying to operate. Obviously, they don't have as money, much money as they used to, um, but I'm unsure it's, you know, choking them off or anything along those lines right now. And have as much money as they used to, but they may not need as much money as they used to. Mike, any exactly. comments on your financial situation yeah, in Iraq? Yeah, I mean, looking back, I mean, it's always worth going back to that uh, RAM study on the, um, you know, the threat finance of the uh, of Al Qaeda in Iraq uh, back in the day, uh, drawn on the Sinjar documents, I think it was. You know, I mean, that thing is always worth going back to because it sort of shows you where the real money pots were and still are. They haven't changed. And, you know, because the Islamic State is so weak in the cities, and I don't think it's just pretending to be weak. Yeah, it's doing some under the surface operations. Maybe it's not using the city as attack environments as much as it might. Uh, maybe there's an intentionality in that. But, you know, ultimately, it's a rural insurgency that lives on peanuts. And it's got a lot of its, um, it's, it's, it's got a lot of infrastructure and inventory, you might say, already in place. And, um, you know, I think if it's, it's probably doing more joint ventures uh, than it ever did before. And by that, I mean, you know, there's an oil field where militias and other corrupt local security forces, um, are quite happy to see diversion of some barrels uh, and you know it works out in everyone's favor um, I, I think you know the thing to look for is Islamic State to be quietly operating in places where there's a communal co community of interest uh, with with corrupt security forces in Syria and in Iraq but the key takeaway for today is that the Islamic State is a rural insurgency that runs on peanuts that is the, the takeaway for today, or at least the, the, the winning one-liner. Um, I want to thank everybody who was able to join us today, either on Blue Jeans, Facebook Live, uh, or on our website, uh, either now or later re, uh, watching these. Uh, please join me in thanking Mike uh, and Aaron uh, for uh, excellent presentations. Uh, wishing everybody well, uh, safety and good health. Uh, have a good rest of, rest of your day. Aaron and Mike, thank you very much.